This is uh, Luxor Temple, which, uh, like Karnak, uh, is uh, led into by a, a column of uh, Sphinx on both sides of the uh, road. Uh, these Sphinx are more traditional looking, though, with human heads instead of uh, ram's heads. And then uh, at the end of the uh, row of uh, Sphinx, uh, there is the traditional uh, Egyptian pylon, which is really a Syrian Migdal fortress. Um, and you can also see the uh, uh, the column that is still there, one of a pair, and the uh, the seated uh, uh, Ramses. Now you've probably always wondered how they got those uh, columns erected. And uh, the next uh, film clip I'm going to show you uh, gives one explanation for how those uh, columns got up there. We actually know quite a bit about how those uh, obelisks were made because uh, we have an unfinished obelisk uh, in, uh, in southern Egypt. And this one was being made for uh, Queen Hatshepsut and uh, it, it never made it out because it is in fact the, the largest uh, obelisk ever attempted and while it was still in the uh, quarry it cracked uh, because of its great uh, size and, and weight. But fortunately, uh, we do have it, and it allows us to figure out how those uh, huge stones were, in fact, quarried. Now, you'd think that something uh, this size would have been uh, uh, brought out with uh, some kind of uh, sophisticated machinery. But this is the tool that was used to knock that uh, obelisk out of, the, out of the quarry, to dig it out. And uh, one of the ways that we can tell that this is in fact the tool uh, is by looking at the, uh, at the trenches that were dug along the, the obelisk. If you look very closely in the trenches, you can see the, uh, the dished areas where that stone, or one like it, was used to pound away this uh, softer uh, stone and uh, that hole right there is actually their beginning to uh, undermine the obelisk to free it uh, from the earth. This is something else that's uh, very interesting. This is an original piece of wood that was used to dovetail together uh, two of those huge stones that we see in the temples. But now let's go back to uh, Luxor and finish our tour there. The most interesting section of Luxor is the uh, the huge hypostyle uh, columns. Now, of course, at one time these columns were all painted and there was a, a roof covering this particular section of the temple. So the building that you're looking at now would have looked a lot more like this sample that you're about to see. This next section, however, this was an open courtyard. And uh, although there would have been perhaps a roof uh, over there where those uh, uh, columns are standing close together, this large open area would not have been enclosed, it would have been open to the sun. And the columns, once again, would have been uh, painted, uh, as virtually every inch of the temple probably would have been. And a sample of what those columns look like is going to be coming up shortly. Uh, incidentally, we're zooming back to the Holy of Holies right now, where the statue of the God would have been.
We're on the uh, west bank uh, of the Nile, the, the bank that has most of the old temples and tombs on it. This is the area of the dead. And off there in the distance, that shimmering is the Nile. You can actually see some ships on it from the, from the balloon as we take off. Now if we turn away from the uh, Nile and look towards the desert, we'll see the uh, Temple of Hatshepsut, and we'll be coming back to that one a little bit later. And uh, also, uh, almost beneath us, is the Ramesseum. The Ramesseum was built by Ramses II, and uh, in many ways it's the inspiration for Shelley's poem, Ozymandias, uh, which is an alternate uh, way of rendering Ramses II's name. You probably had to learn this uh, poem uh, when you were in high school. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Well, these are in fact the, uh, the feet that Shelley was talking about. And they are the feet of a, a huge... Um, a colossal statue of uh, Ramses II <clears throat> that uh, was destroyed uh, in antiquity by uh, by an earthquake. There's virtually nothing left of the of the statue. And if we look around where the statue was, the whole area does look uh, very desolate and uh, very uh, uh, much the way Shelley described it. Nonetheless, if you move just a few feet away. Uh, from the from the statue and start looking at uh, some of the buildings that did survive the earthquake uh, There is actually uh, quite a little bit of the Ramesseum that still exists <clears throat> the Ramesseum uh, is uh, right on the edge of the uh, the new town That's uh, that's up on those hills and you can see a fairly large number of the columns have survived Now getting back to the uh, balloon ride, there's lots of things to see from the air. And one of the things to see, and we'll be going back to it, is the uh, village of the craftsmen that built the tombs uh, in the Valley of the Kings, and we'll be spending some time there. And another thing you can see uh, is the Temple of Ramses III, and we're going to be spending some, some time there in Ramses' place as well. Now, Ramses III is most famous uh, for his defeat of the Sea Peoples. Uh, the Sea Peoples are a somewhat mysterious migration that came down out of the Black Sea, destroyed the Hittite Empire, threw the entire eastern Mediterranean into chaos. But when they reached the uh, Nile Delta, uh, Ramses defeated them. And these are depictions of the Sea Peoples that he, that he defeated. 
and as a result, he probably saved Egyptian civilization. There we see Ramses smiting the Sea Peoples mightily. Now, incidentally, those uh, same Sea Peoples were not uh, entirely made captives by uh, by Ramses, and instead he sort of fought them to a draw, as it were, and uh, they settled. Uh, in the in the Palestine area after the after the battle and they become uh, the Philistines that uh, you read about in the Old Testament Now when you see Philistines on the wall when you see sea peoples on the wall uh, They'll always have this sort of curious little headdress on and that's why you'll be able to tell them from any of the other peoples in the uh, Egyptian drawings Uh, uh, where Ramesses III's uh, temple is located. The temple is located right over here, but here, this place where I am, this is the royal palace. In fact, uh, I'm in the area of the, the royal harem. Now the pharaoh would visit here occasionally, and this is a mud brick building, and uh, occasionally he would take a bath. Now you know, if you take a shower, you take a bath, there's water all over everywhere. The mud brick would dissolve. It would make an awful mess. So, in order not to do that, they have put stone facing here and waterproofed it so that the water will not get to the mud brick and the walls won't come tumbling down. Now, isn't it interesting? The temple right over here is made of huge massive stones but the royal palace is only made of mud brick what kind of culture would build a mud brick house for the king but a fine stone temple for the gods